Hello and welcome. Currently I am working on multiple projects which need more time than I planned. So I decided to make some smaller side projects and to continue sorting the hardware which I got donated from a January scrap hunter in the recent months. And today I would like to take a closer look at some Socket 7 mainboards. And the first one is the famous Asus PI P55T2P4. I got this board, as you see it here, with CPU and RAM. Asus P55T2P4 was one of the best and widely used mainboards of its time. It is based on the Intel 430HX chipset, also known as Triton 2, which many consider as the best Socket 7 chipset. It was not the last Socket 7 chipset from Intel, but it was ahead of its time in some ways. After the very successful Triton 1, aka 430FX, Intel produced the 430HX chipset with some improvements. First of all, it supported more memory, now instead of 128MB it could handle 512MB, which was an insane amount back then. But more important, with extended tag, it could cache up to 512MB of RAM, which means higher performance with memory above 64MB, which was maximum for the predecessor. However, back in the days also 64MB of RAM were far beyond what a normal user could afford, and so this improvement was not really interesting for an average user back then. And today it's another story. I have plenty of 32MB EDO RAM modules and could easily upgrade this board to 128MB. But 430HX was designed more for workstations and servers in mind, which needed so much memory. This chipset also supported ECC memory and SMP, which allowed to create multi-processor systems. So yeah, basically interesting features for servers and workstations. For an average user who uh, couldn't afford to have so much memory and also didn't necessarily need it as much, 430HX was a bit expensive and outdated. For example, it lacked support for more modern SD RAM. So later Intel introduced 430VX and 430TX chipsets without features like SMP and ECC and which supported 128 and not 256 megabytes of maximum memory. But those chipsets were cheaper, supported SDRAM and were almost just as fast as the 430HX as long as you used 64 megabytes of RAM or less, because that was maximum cacheable size. As I said, even 64 megabytes back then was an overkill for an average user and a Normal retro system from that time usually doesn't need more than that. It's much more important that faster SD RAM could be used and so the system provided better overclocking capabilities, but also 430VX and 430TX chipsets were used on newer boards, which also often provided an ATX power supply connector besides AT. One of such ports I already showed on my channel some time ago, this QDI board, which was an object for one of my projects and became recently even more awesome than it ever was. But this is a story for another video. And now I would like to come back to this 430HX board and see if there is something to do. So the CPU which was installed here is an Intel Pentium MMX 166MHz. The socket is a bit dirty. I wouldn't expect it from an expensive board like this one, but unfortunately the Dallas real-time clock module is soldered here. After all those years, it is most probably discharged and has to be replaced. Let's take a look at the memory modules. This one has an 8 on it, so I guess this is an 8 megabyte module. The second one should be identical, so 16 megabytes in total so far. This module has 16 in the name, so I assume it is a 16 megabytes one. Times 2 makes 32 megabytes plus the other 16 megabytes, uh, that makes 48 megabytes of total RAM. Probably this configuration comes as it has been used back in the days 
And as you see, the memory mount which was installed here is far from theoretically usable 512 megabytes. Okay, let's make a test. I'll leave everything as is. Oh, let's make a brief test for a shorts on the power rails. No shorts, everything's fine. Well, some postcodes are running. Looks like we have a working board, at least to some extent. Yeah, there is a picture as well. The bad thing is that the battery in the RTC module is drained indeed. But that was expected and that means that the BIOS settings will not be saved. But the good news is that the default BIOS settings have primary IDE device set to auto detection. So we should be able to boot into DOS even with an empty RTC module battery. Let's add a compact flash to IDE adapter and give it a try. And here we go, the system has booted into Microsoft DOS just fine. The CPU is set and detected properly. It is a 166mmx. As a brief stability test, let's run Doom and Quake benchmarks. In Doom we get 916 points, which is not bad for the given system. In Quake we uh, have 43 FPS, also reasonable value, but the most important point is that this board seems to be almost fine. The only one thing which has to be done is fixing the RTC module. I showed already many times on my channel which options we have there. But for now, let's put this board aside and see what else we have in the stack today. And would you look at that, another P55-T2-P4 from different revision. Let's compare. Ok, first obvious thing is the cache slot. Yeah, this board has only 256k of cache on board, which can be extended to 512k. The other board has already 512k on board and there is no point for the additional slot. By the way, as you see, there is an empty cache tag socket and a jumper nearby, which can be used to select between 64 and 512 megabytes of cacheable memory. To be able to cache the full 512 megabytes additional tag I see is required. Here's a small remark why I decided to take a look at this board today. Recently Reese from Control Alt Reese showed a not so tiny PC on his channel, which has a similar cache expansion slot. He asked the community if there is an interest in extending the cache there and I answered that the cache cannot be extended but only replaced completely. This was my experience on some boards so far. However, as I looked through my to-do box I saw this board which has additional jumpers to switch between 256 and 512k which would only make sense if the cache can be extended. So if this board is working I will try if the cache can be actually extended in this one. For the test I will just move some of the memory and the CPU from the other board. We already know that those parts are working fine. There are no shorts. And the postcodes are running nice. Most probably another board which just works. And we have a picture and the compact flash card has been also detected. But the most amazing thing about this board is that the battery in the Dallas RTC module seems still to be intact. The module on this board is soldered as well and is the original one with the date code from 1996. After almost 30 years, that's insane. Look at the reported cache amount, that's uh, 256k, keep that number in mind. Now let's see if it can boot into DOS. And it does, nice. 
Okay, now let's switch the jumper and add another 256k cash module. Theoretically, we should now see 512k of uh, total detected cash. Yeah, and we do indeed. So I was wrong, as I told Reese, that the cash cannot be extended. Obviously, at least on some boards it can. And it would be interesting to see if Reese's tiny PC can handle this and which performance difference uh, he can measure. I will not do any tweaking or comparison today, but at least this board in this configuration reports the same performance as the previous board. Perfect. I don't have many of those cost modules, so I will remove it again from this board for now and set the jumper back to 256k. Just as on the previous board, here the RTC module is soldered too. However, on the second one the battery is still working, which is incredible. If you compare the date codes, this one was made in the 37th week of 1996 and this one has been made 10 weeks later. And though the later one is drained, probably one PC was much more in use than the other one, since the RTC battery should only discharge when the PC is turned off. If one PC is been on much more often than the other one, then the RTC was mostly powered by the PSU and the battery could survive a lot longer. Well, who knows where this hardware is coming from. As I said, a 430HX boards were often used in servers, which could be kept on for years, and that could extend the life of the battery. Okay, I obviously got two very similar and working mainboards with RTC module soldered directly to the PCB. A drained battery inside of that module would prevent any BIOS settings from saving, and I already showed many times how this can be replaced. One of the solutions would be to drill some holes in the right spots and attach an external battery. I also showed how to completely dismantle such a module, which is my preferred way meanwhile. Unfortunately, not everybody has a proper equipment and trust to disorder the RTC module from the board. Many are afraid to overheat and damage the PCB, so today I would like to try to dismantle the module without disoldering it from the board. All what is needed is a screwdriver and some hot air. Even a simple hair dryer with a thin nozzle would probably be sufficient. The required temperature shouldn't go over 100 degrees Celsius. At that temperature the resin inside of the module should become brittle and easy to crack. First, let's remove the plastic case. Now, where the plastic case has been removed, the resin has to be heated up and removed piece by piece. Well, that seems to be totally doable. It's not quite as clean as desoldering the whole module, because some resin still stuck between the pins, but that's just cosmetics. A thinner screwdriver can help to remove the smaller leftovers. Now all what has uh, to be done is to desolder the old battery and solder a new one. In my case um, that was just a proof of concept, if you want so, which totally worked, but I still like to install a socket here. Not only would it look cleaner, it would also simplify a module replacement in the future for someone who likes the original look. So the module is desoldered. Let's fix the crystal with uh, some hot glue and add a battery holder.
Off camera I already installed a new socket. Now let's put our small monster back in place and give it a try. I left the 166mmx in the other board and inserted a 200MHz MMX into this one. Let's see. The postcodes are running and the picture is also already there. The first what we can see is that the error message about the empty CMOS battery has gone. That's a good sign. Checksum error is expected since the BIOS settings were not yet saved. Let's see if that will work too. The seconds are ticking as well, that means that the crystal on the module did survive the operation. If I would heat up the module too much previously the crystal could have been damaged, but it is obviously fine. And the CMOS checksum error has gone, that means that the settings were saved properly, nice. As I said, this system is now equipped with a Pentium 200 MMX. In Doom we are getting 855 real ticks. That is about 60 real ticks faster than with 166mmx previously. That's like 6 to 7%. As you see the speed up is not linear for many reasons. But the important note is that the modded and socketed RTC module is working. And I think this is a good spot to make a break here and continue next time. I hope you enjoyed this video, even if both boards were working. The coast extension and the in-PCB module modding was something what I can now scratch from my to-do list. Both experiments were successful. Eventually I socketed the RTC module on this board and also on this one. I installed a socket of camera. Here the Dallas module is still working, but that of course will not last forever and Whoever will use this board in the future will be able to replace the module easily with whatever solution wanted. So join me next time if you want to see more Socket 7 mainboards. I invested a lot of time recently in this generation of boards and there will be some exciting surprises. And for now, thank you for watching and goodbye.